but kind of combination of things. Nobody knew what psilocybin was. We could keep it sort of under the radar screen. And it was over in four to six hours. So somebody could come in, you could do a session and start at 10 in the morning and you could be done in the afternoon and they could go home and have a restful night. Charge up your axons, ready your receptors, and shift your lobes into upper beta phase. You are listening to Smart Drug Smarts, the podcast dedicated to helping you optimize your brain with the latest breakthroughs in neuroscience, nootropics, and psychopharmacology. Hello and welcome to Smart Drug Smarts. My name is Jesse Lawler. I am your host, and this is the 176th episode of this podcast dedicated to anything and everything that you can do to improve the workings of your brain, or even occasionally just make your brain a more interesting place to live. In this episode, we're going to be getting back to a topic that we've covered a couple of times before, but is one that is worth going back to the well on because there's a wealth of new research data coming out and more interesting anecdotal information than we could ever shake a stick at or even multiple sticks. And that topic is psychedelics. Now, it might be that this is our Easter episode, and in fact, that's true. This is Easter weekend 2017 as we publish, but this is also our Bicycle Day episode. April 19th is Bicycle Day, which we've talked about before on this show, the day on which Albert Hoffman, the inventor of the LSD-25 molecule, first imbibed a perceptual amount of LSD, basically had the first LSD trip in the history of the world, and Bicycle Day is the little-known holiday that commemorates that event. And we're going to be talking with one of the absolute leaders in the current generation of psychedelics research, Dr. David Nichols. If you were to play a game of Six Degrees of separation or really even one degree of separation in all the major psychedelics research that's happened in the past 10 to 20 years, David Nichols would be a great guy to choose as the hub of that wheel. I will give him a proper introduction in just a few minutes, but a very interesting interview to follow. If you hang around until the very end of the episode, being that it is Easter weekend, I'm going to tell you some fun trivia facts about Easter, why it is that we have chocolate rabbits, among other things. Not exactly intuitive how they're involved, but you will find out more in the Ruthless Listener Retention gimmick. But as usual, let's kick things off first with This Week in Neuroscience. Smart Drug Smarts, this week in neuroscience. So in this era of fake news, when press secretaries talk about things like alternate facts, it is all too easy to remember that there are lots of false beliefs out there that not everybody believes the same thing. Sometimes the more enlightened among us are aware that we might even have false beliefs ourselves. But it is sometimes difficult to remember as an adult that all of us passed through a period during which the idea of a false belief wasn't even something that we could articulate or perhaps even conceptualize. This is what it's like to be a child under the age of four, and this is a pretty well understood thing by child researchers that as theory of mind develops, the ability for kids to realize that people can have differing beliefs about the world, that not everybody believes the same thing, we're able to get some of these higher level social processing abilities in kind of a herky-jerky, awkward fashion. Not all of these abilities come online at the same time. And there's apparently about a two-year lag time almost between something called implicit and explicit false belief processing. Some of you may have heard of something called the Sally Ann test that's presented to very young children. It goes a little something like like this. Two characters, Sally and Anne. Sally has a box, Anne has a basket, something like that. Sally puts a marble into her box, then leaves the scene. Anne takes the marble out of the box and puts it into the basket. Then Sally wanders back into the scene, unaware of what's happened while she was gone. And the kid viewing this is asked, where is Sally going to look for the marble? The asking and being forced to articulate the answer, that's the explicit part. By age four, kids are starting to get this right. They're understanding that Sally's belief about where the marble is versus where the marble actually is, those don't necessarily have to correspond with one another, two or three year olds consistently get this one wrong. They can't seem to remember or at least articulate that the ideas in Sally's head no longer actually map onto the way that the world is. And researchers at the Max Planck Institute for Human Cognitive and Brain Sciences in Leipzig have recently been able to show the actual structural changes in the brain that takes place during that window between three and four years of age that allows kids to make this developmental leap. Apparently, the difference is due to the maturation of fibers in a brain structure called the arcuate fascicle. And this structure connects two critical brain regions, one of which is an area in the frontal lobe known to help keep things at different levels of abstraction. Think of ideas as Russian dolls, where one idea encapsulates another idea encapsulates another idea. And another region at the back of the brain, which is known in adults to support thinking about other people and their beliefs. So the arcuate fascicle connects these two regions, and the researchers have shown that between the ages of three and four, when this area develops in most children, that is when the ability for children to explicitly pass false belief tests come online. This finding also 
also seems to be backed up by similar studies looking at great apes who have been shown to be able to pass an implicit false belief task, but not to exhibit theory of mind abilities. And in great apes other than humans, the arcuate fascicle is very weak says Charlotte Gross Wiesman, the first author on this study. The strong arcuate fascicle might be the reason why humans are particularly good at understanding what other people think and predicting their actions. Although apes also seem to understand other individuals, they do this to a much lesser extent. This might be the result from a weaker fiber connection. Also, possibly not surprisingly, the arcuate fascicle is known to be involved in language processing. It also connects the posterior temporal region of the brain with Broca's area, which is involved in sentence comprehension. Finally, the ability of children to explicitly handle the false belief tests occurs independently of other cognitive abilities, such as general intelligence, language ability, or impulse control. Smart Drug Smarts, the podcast so smart, we have smart in our title, twice. Picked up a couple of five-star reviews on iTunes this past week. Actually, scratch that because there were way more than two five-star reviews on iTunes this week, thanks in large part to the contest that we kicked off last week. Two human chargers to give away for reviews for Smart Drug Smarts that come in on iTunes this month. If you don't know what I'm talking about, don't know what a human charger is or what this contest is, I refer you back to last week's episode, smartdrugsmarts.com slash 175. But it's worth checking out a cool gadget, cool technology, and a very easy contest to enter. For inspiration, here's two of them that have come in recently. Biomed Mastery from the USA says, I have been a longtime fan of this show, and the episodes are getting better and better. This podcast tells me what books to read, which researchers I should follow next, and what stuff might be either understudied or pseudoscience. And Moffs from Denmark says, The guests on this show are professionals, and there is no hidden agenda being pushed. Several episodes contradict previous ones, but this is exactly how science is supposed to be. In a world of self-proclaimed gurus and experts, this podcast is a goldmine of unbiased information. Well, thank you both very, very much. Thanks to everybody who has entered podcast reviews on iTunes or elsewhere, or spread the word in whatever way comes in handy for you. Every little bit counts, and all of it's very much appreciated. Reminder that we've got the Brain Breakfast newsletter. If you have not yet signed up for that, you can do so over at smartdrugsmarts.com slash newsletter, or you can find the link on the footer of pretty much any page on the smartdrugsmarts.com website. And if you happen to be on smartdrugsmarts.com, you'll also see a shop link up in the header bar. And you can use that to navigate over to axonlabs.io. Axon Labs is the retail end of things over here at Smart Drug Smarts, where we've got a couple of new tropic stacks, Nexus and Mitogen. When I get done recording these segments, I'm about to go for a run. So I actually just popped two Mitogen, some mitochondrial raw materials to help with the synthesis of ATP, adenosine triphosphate, which is used by both muscles and brain as kind of the common energy currency at an intracellular level. It's funny thinking about which ways to exercise to be most beneficial to the brain overall. There's so many different opinions on this, and not just just opinions, but studies showing one thing to be more beneficial than another. Personally, I tried to do a bit of a grab bag approach. I did squats and weightlifting yesterday, but today it's conspicuously nice outside. Makes me want to get outside, and so I'm going to go for a longer run. Try to encourage the secretion of some BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, and a bit of mitogen to make sure that I'm not tiring out along the path. Both mitogen and nexus, once again, can be found online at axonlabs.io. But let's scoot along now to the main interview. Smart Drug Smarts. So I'm about to be speaking with Dr. David Nichols, who is really one of the biggest names in the world in the study of psychedelics. He is the founding president of something called the Hefter Research Institute, which is a major research organization devoted to the study of the uses of psychedelics, potential therapeutic applications, non-recreational uses, and just getting a better understanding of the psychopharmacology of these very potent substances, which despite the fact that many of them have been available for academic study for 50, 60 years, actually conducting those studies has been blackballed for a lot of that time, and that's just started starting to change now. This moment in the history of psychedelic research, it feels a little bit like the mammals coming out after the dinosaurs were all killed off by the asteroid, that the danger has passed and we're entering a period of opportunity and potential explosive growth. But we'll see, it's still early in the game. Dr. David Nichols has been in this game a long time. Back in 2004, he was addressing the International Serotonin Club. Yes, there is such a thing. And he gave a speech entitled 35 Years Studying Psychedelics. And that was back in 2004, so it gives you an idea of how long he's been at this. You're going to hear reference in this conversation to other past interviewees who he's intersected with over the course of his career, Dennis McKenna, Robin Carhart-Harris, Dr. Rick Strassman. All of these researchers are, are part of a fairly tight cadre from the sounds of it, sort of the academic torchbearers for psychedelic study. And in this conversation, we're going to get a good overview both of where we've been and where we seem to be going in the study of psychedelics, how they operate, what they might be able to do for people therapeutically, and where things seem to be moving on the shifting political and social landscape. So with that as preamble, let's jump in with Dr. David Nichols. 
I lived in Cincinnati during the summer of love in 1960s, Hey Dashbury, et cetera. None of that happened in Cincinnati. <laughs> and so, as you can imagine, the one hippie commune they had in Cincinnati up on Calhoun Street, the fire department came and condemned them all and ran them all out. Oh, no. My friends all went away to college. I stayed home. I didn't have the money to go away. I stayed home and commuted to University of Cincinnati. So they'd come back on weekends with all these stories about psychedelics and LSD was hitting the campus. And so I got pretty interested in it. And basically was always interested in how the brain worked. And these substances seemed really powerful. I mean, my friends were going, wow, this stuff is incredible. You should take it. You should try it. This is amazing. So as I read, began to realize that these substances often changed people's lives, sometimes for the worse, sometimes for the better. But I thought, how can a small molecule do that? How is it that a drug can diffuse into the brain, stay there a couple of hours, diffuse back out, and sometimes people never see the world the same way again? So that seemed to me to be a really interesting question. And I was always interested in philosophy, the meaning of life, and so forth. And so it seemed to me like wherever those drugs were working, or however they were working, they must be impinging on some very fundamental part of the brain. When I got in this field, I had this fantasy of writing a book called The Biochemical Basis of Religious Experience. That's kind of iconoclastic. I never did it, but, you know, that was sort of kind of my thinking. It's a great title. You still should write it. <laughs> Well, it would be tough, but uh, yeah. So kind of got into it just as an academic exercise. Was lucky because not many people were funded to work in this field. Back in the 50s and 60s, of course, there was a lot of federal money from the National Institutes of Health and National Institutes of Mental Health, etc., to work in this area. But by the time I got in, 1969, LSD had been made illegal in several states. The Controlled Substance Act of 1970 was passed. I was a grad student in my second year in 1970. Mm -hmm. So that kind of said, you know, this is going to be a problem to work in this field. But I kept getting funded. I had almost 30 years of funding from the National Institute on Drug Abuse, mainly basic science work. How do they work? What are the molecular features of these substances? And how do they activate receptors and so forth? So as long as I kept getting funding, it was a really interesting field to be in. I felt like I was doing something important. This is similar, I think, to Dr. Rick Strassman's story of having to approach this from such a basic science perspective. It's almost like you're working behind enemy lines to try to explore some of these ideas you're interested in, even though maybe the institutional review boards are hoping to find something so you can say drugs are bad, toe the Nancy Reagan line instead. I never had that problem so much because I worked with rats and worked with brain homogenates and you know things like that. So I didn't have the clinical aspect of it. Rick and I communicated quite a bit when he did his DMT study, and I'd encouraged him to do this because he was a psychiatrist, he had a pedigree, and that was a theme that I'd hammered to a lot of people that sort of had withdrawn from this field and says, oh, you'll never be able to work in this field, the government will never fund you, you'll never be able to do it. And I had met Rick in 1984 at a meeting in Esalen, and I said, you know, you could do this, you're a psychiatrist, University of New Mexico, if you're really interested, you could do it. We dialogued for a bit. We had several meetings with Danny Friedman, who was then the interim head of UCLA Psychiatry. Danny encouraged Rick, encouraged me to encourage Rick. And so Rick started the process, and he's documented it in a paper, what it took to do it. But he said to me at one point, what if I get all the paperwork approved and I can't get the DMT? And I had made a bunch of MDMA for Rick Doblin and MAPS, and I had worked with the FDA. So that didn't put me off too much. And I said, well, if you get all the approvals, you know, I'll make you the DMT. It shouldn't be any harder. And that's actually what happened. He couldn't get anybody who would make DMT that could be administered to humans. So I made the DMT for him. So it was it's kind of fun to watch these flowers that had been dormant for years and years and years begin to bloom. It's interesting. I read Rick's book, which referenced you and gave that same story. And it's great seeing the interconnectedness of several of you working together over the course of the last couple of decades. Let's fast forward to the last 15 or so years where it seems like there really has been a great deal less reluctance of various review boards to allow some of these studies and how they might be affecting humans. Tell us about that sort of opening up process and what you see as the logical next steps for maybe the next five or 10 years of research where we might see results. Well, a big change occurred actually with Rick Strassman's application to the FDA. There had been a number of requests at the FDA to do research with psychedelics, and they'd all been shelved, apparently. And there was a new fellow that joined the Food and Drug Administration, Curtis Wright. He was an MD, and he saw all these applications on hold and started talking it up among the FDA people and said, why isn't this research being done? Is there any reason that there shouldn't be research in this field? The conclusion was, if these things are written to current standards with proper safeguards and patient safety and proper 
human since, there's no reason that research can't be done. So Strassman's studies giving DMT to humans, although they weren't therapeutic, were really the first in the 20 years or so to administer a psychedelic to the humans. And once you've given DMT intravenously, almost nothing else you would give to people would be much of an emotional or mental challenge. Right. Throwing them into the deep end of the pool for sure. Yeah. So I started the Hefter Research Institute in 1993. And it was my belief that these studies could be done, that you just needed private money to fund the work. You couldn't get it from the government. You still can't get it from the government. And so my idea was to start this institute. And I had this naive idea that all the Silicon Valley types that had used psychedelics and creating their algorithms and new software ideas and so forth, that they would just be jumping at the chance to fund this kind of work because many of them just openly admitted that, you know, that was one of the, you know, like Steve Jobs, that was one of the best things I ever did was take LSD. Right. And Kerry Mullis and the discovery of the polymerase chain reaction. So we had some contacts with Silicon Valley people, but nothing ever came of it. Bob Wallace was our first donor. He was the ninth employee of Microsoft. Microsoft. He supported us to the tune of, I think, about 100,000 a year in the early years, really before we had much of a focus. But once we actually got enough money to do something, we thought, okay, what's the thing we can do to get the most bang for the buck? And if you look back in the literature of the 50s and 60s, one of the most well-documented uses for LSD was in treating cancer patients who were dying. And there was work done in Spring Grove Hospital with Stan Groff and uh, Savage and Unger and a bunch of people. And they had shown that 60 to 70 people given LSD under their conditions showed improvement to some degree. Some much improved, some modestly improved, but 60 or 70 percent saw some improvement. And that was based on an early study that was done in the mid-50s by an internist in Chicago named Eric Cast, who had compared the analgesic effect of LSD with an opioid. He'd heard that LSD had painkilling effects. And so he gave them to these patients. He gave a couple of opioids. I forget which ones they were, but classical type morphine analogs and LSD. And LSD was just as efficacious as the opioids during the duration of action. But for the patients who got the LSD, a fair percentage of them changed their perspective on death and dying. And they were pretty gravely ill. He was very curious about that phenomenon. wrote a couple of papers back in the mid-50s. That was sort of the springboard for the Spring Grove work with LSD, and they also used another compound called DPT, dipropyl tryptamine, to look at the effect of psychedelics on people's attitudes about dying, depression, anxiety. So in the Hefter Institute, we sat around and we said, you know, this seems like the application that would make the most sense. We have the biggest chance to get a positive result because we didn't have a lot of money and we didn't want to blow it on something that we just say, okay, we did another study and it's inconclusive. So Charlie did a small study of end-stage cancer patients. I think he had maybe 10 patients, 10 or 12, I can't remember the number now and uh, gave them psilocybin rather than LSD. And we were concerned that if we used LSD, although that was the drug that had worked in the 60s, in the earlier work, we were concerned that if we used LSD, there would be a media feeding frenzy. Everybody would be talking about, oh, they're using LSD, giving LSD to dying people. And we just thought at that point in time, this is back in the 90s, late 90s, we thought this will be a disaster. So you don't have a lot of choices in the classical psychedelics. And we also didn't want to use something that had not ever been really tested extensively. You know, Sasha Shogun made a lot of compounds, published them in these books, TCAL and PCAL, but none of them had ever been put through toxicology tests so you couldn't pick one of those. So we really had to choose between LSD, mescaline, and psilocybin, or you could use maybe DMT, but it's so short-acting. And we thought LSD is going to be a problem. The media is going to be all over it. Mescaline lasts a long time, makes people sick sometimes. Sometimes they vomit. You really don't want to do that. Nobody knew much about psilocybin. And if you met someone on the street 15 years ago and said, oh, yeah, we're using psilocybin in a treatment program, they'd go, psilocybin, what's that? I'd say, have you ever heard of magic mushrooms, shrooms? Oh, yeah, yeah, back in college people were taking those. I'd say, well, that's the active ingredient in those mushrooms. So nobody really knew much about it. And I had spent a lot of time trying to improve the synthesis when I was still working with Rick Strassman because he wanted to go ahead and do work with psilocybin after he finished the DMP studies. He left his career before then for personal reasons. And so I had still continued to work on it and came up with what was a better way to do it, I thought. And so I made some for Roland Griffiths for a sub-study. He was starting at about the same time. So we decided to use psilocybin and Charlie's study was underpowered. The dose was probably too low, but he still got positive trends and at six months, 
got a significant reduction in depression improvement in mood. So that was sort of enough to say, you know, we've got a signal here. So then there were two larger studies, just been completed, just accepted for publication in the Journal of Psychopharmacology. They'll probably be out in print in a couple months. One at Johns Hopkins University and one at New York University, both basically funded by the Hefter Institute. And the uh, total enrollment is around, I think, 80 patients using psilocybin, a somewhat larger dose. They meet the gold standard. They're placebo-controlled, double-blind. And uh, we've demonstrated in both of those studies that psilocybin, given in the context of that treatment protocol, significantly reduces anxiety and depression. And the treatment involves a number of hours of psychotherapy with a dyad of therapist, a male and female therapist beforehand to establish rapport and trust with the therapist. And then a single session where the drug, or in case of the placebo control, where the placebo was given. Was the placebo an inert placebo or was it something else that somebody might feel? In the case of the Johns Hopkins study, the placebo was a, a low dose of psilocybin which has no detectable behavioral effects. So in that case, he could tell everybody who is a subject, you will get psilocybin in, in all of the occasions where you're dosed, but they wouldn't know whether it was low or high dose. So what that did was control for expectancy. If you thought that you were going to have a treatment that lowered your anxiety and improved your mood, then by using this non-psychoactive dose, you could tease out what effect that was. And there was some effect, but it was nothing like when they got psilocybin as the primary dose. And then they were switched, and then the ones who got the low dose then got the high dose, and the ones who got the high dose then got the low dose. And then the second study at New York University, they used niacin as the placebo, which is the same thing that Charlie Grobe used. Niacin is not a psychoactive drug, but it produces tingling and flushing of the skin. So again, it was the same thing, placebo versus psilocybin as an inactive dose. Those two studies uh, took several years, very extensive, and those have now been accepted for publication, as I said, in Journal of Psychopharmacology. The results, I asked Roland at Johns Hopkins, I said, so what is the response rate in the study with psilocybin? And I don't know if you know, if you do a clinical trial with an antidepressant, there's a response and there's a remission. Mm -hmm. A response rate means that your symptoms were reduced by about 50%. A remission means that your symptoms were reduced so far that you're no longer qualified as depression. So the response rate was 85%, but most of those went off the bottom end of the scale. So a really good response response rate unprecedented and we had a consultant who's done research with antidepressants before and when he first saw these data he just said I can't believe it there's nothing that works like this this is amazing and of course with an SSRI you have to give it repeatedly this is a one or two time treatment and they followed out to I think six months with these patients and they still get good antidepressant effects. The duration is out to at least six months. We're really hoping that these two publications when they come out will really be a watershed moment for this field because there's lots of hints and anecdotes and so forth with alcohol. Another one that LSD was used for was treating alcoholism and people for years thought that LSD, we didn't know if it worked or not. The results were inconclusive. And then a couple years ago, Krebs and Johansson did a meta-analysis where they took all the studies where LSD had been used to treat alcoholism and looked at the ones that could be put together. They had a similar design, they had a placebo control, and I think they analyzed a total of 437 or 537 patients who had been treated with LSD. And when they did a meta-analysis, indeed it turns out that LSD does significantly improve sobriety. So we had started a study, Hefter had been sponsoring a study at the University of New Mexico with Dr. Michael Bogenschutz, who was a big substance abuse researcher. He's now moved to New York University, but he did a study of alcoholics with psilocybin using the same treatment protocol as psychotherapy, placebo control, and then showed that he got a significant increase in sobriety, fewer drinking days, less drinking, and that's persisted for a long time. And they're expanding that study now. It's a Hefter-sponsored study at New York University that's going to look at a much larger cohort of patients, I think 90 patients, using the same kind of strategy with before and after brain imaging, functional MRI imaging, to see what's happened to brain patterns of activity and functional connectivity. And we also sponsored a study of smoking, a nicotine addiction at Johns Hopkins. That was done by Matt Johnson. He took long-term smokers who had made at least four attempts to quit smoking and had failed 
and used basically the same treatment approach with them and got 80% abstinence at a short-term follow-up. And I think at, at one year, it was 60-some percent had quit smoking. And these are people who tried to quit smoking at least four times and had just sort of given up. And so, you know, Chantix is the main medication out there that they sort of promote for smoking cessation. People who are given Chantix in a program of psychotherapy, et cetera, sort of the best you get for cessation is around 30, 35 percent. So 60 some percent of one year is just unprecedented. Let me ask you this. Obviously, so much money is made by antidepressant medications, not to mention the cigarette industry. It sounds like there are so many potential therapeutic uses for psychedelics that stand to cost entrenched players a whole lot of money if these things are actually accepted as sort of a normal standard of care. Are you worried about that? I mean, do you have a strategy in mind for how to get the Prozac police from somehow demonizing psychedelics because they would rather have people continually buying Prozac than using a one-time psilocybin treatment? I've been asked that question quite a bit. My first part of my answer is that I don't think the drug companies understand this yet. They don't understand the power of this therapeutic approach, and so they're not really concerned about it. If you could really imagine that when someone was severely depressed, that the standard thing they would do would be to go to get a therapy session with a psychedelic. And if that became widespread and sort of the standard of care, I think the drug companies probably would lobby to prevent these things from being marketed. But I don't think they're on top of it yet. And I think by the time they realize what's happened, it's going to be a fait accompli. You know, it's like these papers coming out now. How do you stop them from being promoted and talked about and discussed? And then all of a sudden, there's more pressure to do research. And the thing that we're finding, the Hefter Institute is partnered up with another institute in Wisconsin called the USONA Institute. We started dialogue with the Food and Drug Administration to move toward a phase three clinical trial. We're finding a lot of people now, as they're hearing more about these intermediate results, investigators at big name schools are getting very excited about the possibility of maybe being a phase three site. You know, phase three site is a multi-center site that involves lots and lots of patients. And the goal is to see if the therapy that works in a small study will be applicable to the study that's carried out over several different locations by different investigators, sort of using the same paradigm. So you can prove that it's not just a fluke that happened because these particular guys at this place sort of knew something nobody else knew. Right. So we're seeing a lot of mainline investigators who are starting to say, this is really interesting. I was just at a meeting of the International Society for Serotonin Research. These are the guys who study sort of every aspect of serotonin in the brain. It's kind of a small group of people. But I organized a symposium that was called Psychedelics Out of the Closet After 50 Years of Neglect. Afterwards, people came up and said, that is the best symposium we've had at this meeting ever. The people that are in the field really get excited because psychedelics really started serotonin research back in the 40s. If LSD hadn't been discovered, a lot of these drugs we have, like SSRIs or drugs for migraine, probably wouldn't have been discovered or wouldn't have been discovered as quickly as they were. Let's actually talk a little bit about serotonin and the various serotonin receptors in the brain. Serotonin is famously thought of as a good mood neurotransmitter, but it's obviously doing a whole lot of different things, and psychedelics do a whole lot of things other than just put people in a good mood. Can you sort of break that down a little bit? The two kinds of receptors that we know about for transmitters are called the G-protein coupled receptors, or GPCRs, and then there are the ion-gated channels. And there's one serotonin receptor that's ion-gated, and it's different than all the rest. But of the others, well, there are 14 different subtypes going from 5-HT1A, 1B, 5-HT2A, 2B, 2C, 5-HT3, 5-HT5, etc., etc., etc. They all play different roles in the brain depending on where they're located and expressed. They can be involved in cognition, in sexual activity, appetite, satiety, dreams, sleeping, etc. The serotonin 2 class receptors, which are the ones that the psychedelics interact with, are probably the oldest class of serotonin receptor. If you look at a hierarchical analysis and go back in time and say, what were the first receptors? Probably the 5-HT2 type receptors were. And they show up in very primitive organisms, single cell organisms like paramecium, for example, have 5-HT2 receptors. Fruit flies, C. elegans, worms have 5-HT2 receptors. It's all over in the brain, especially in the higher centers of the brain in the cortex, that's expressed on pyramidal cells in the cortex. And these are sort of the CPUs, if you will, of the brain. Information you use to make decisions and your thought and everything in executive functions of the brain is really run by these pyramidal cells in the cortex. And so the serotonin 2A receptors are expressed on these pyramidal cells and they make them become sensitive, more sensitive than they normally are. 
And I would say people think that serotonin is the feel-good chemical, but actually if you give someone a drug that just releases serotonin, so there's a drug called fenfluramine, which was used for appetite control, obesity control. If you give somebody fenfluramine, they don't feel happy. They feel blah, kind of depressed, just want to lay around. They don't have any energy. So the idea that serotonin is the feel-good chemical is probably more related to an indirect effect. Probably the, the feel-good chemical in the brain is actually dopamine. That's the transmitter that's most affected by things like methamphetamine, cocaine, amphetamine, things that make you feel really good and euphoric. So probably serotonin is working through an indirect modulation of some of those dopamine areas in the brain. But serotonin is clearly a very important transmitter. And the serotonin 2A receptor is the one that seems to really be a hit by the psychedelics, LSD and psilocybin. Although there are others, the 2A receptor is the one that seems to be the most important one, and that's the primary target. You mentioned earlier on your decision for that study why you went with psilocybin versus LSD. It was essentially a political decision. For the actual pharmacology between psilocybin and LSD, can you talk a little about that? What one is doing that the other doesn't? What some of the differences are both biochemically and experientially for people that use them? I think you'd have to say that in terms of profundity, if you will, the most profound effects of a psychedelic probably occur, at least orally, with uh, LSD. You know, you can talk about giving intravenous DMT. There's another one, 5-methoxy-DMT. These things are unbelievably powerful psychedelics. But in terms of the ordinary person, a dose of LSD would last about eight hours, eight to 10 hours maybe. The dose of psilocybin would last four to six hours. It's shorter. Uh, LSD also has some sort of weird psychoactive effects. This was documented years ago by a, one of the early LSD investigators named Daniel Friedman. He noticed that when people took LSD the first four or five hours, they were very euphoric, very psychedelic. Mood was elevated. Music was great. And then somewhere around the fourth or fifth hour, things turned very weird. And he said their ideas were really more like what you see with amphetamine psychosis, paranoid ideas ideas of reference and he said you know something happens sort of midway between these two states and we actually did studies in rats and rats at Purdue University when I was still there where we showed that if you give rats LSD for the first hour or so the behavioral effects are mediated by activation of serotonin 2a receptors but after that it changes over and the effects are mediated by activation of dopamine receptors so it may be the 5-HT 2a receptor initially signals what's happening but then the pharmacology starts to shift and you go to something that's more dominated by a sort of dopamine pharmacology. And of course, nobody's really teased that up because there's been no money to really research that field. But it was more probably the length of action. We thought if the drug lasts eight hours, you're going to have to keep people overnight, maybe to the next day. So that's going to increase the cost of the study. But more importantly, the fact that if we were using LSD, we thought that once the media got wind of that, that they would be all over it. A kind of combination of things. Nobody knew what psilocybin was. We could keep it sort of under the radar screen. And it was over in four to six hours. So somebody could come in, you could do a session and start at 10 in the morning, and you could be done in the afternoon and they could go home and have a restful night. So there were some practical considerations as well. It still may be that LSD can do things that psilocybin can't do, and we don't know that. And the question has come up in the Hefter board, does LSD work better than psilocybin? And we don't really know. There may be cases where it does work better. In the early studies with alcoholism, they used LSD. We know that in the pilot study that Michael Bogenschutz did that psilocybin worked, but would more patients respond or would it be a more robust response? And at some point, you know, once people realize these are important areas to work in, at some point somebody will do that study and they'll compare what happens when we use LSD instead of psilocybin. Are there more adverse effects? You know, are the adverse reactions more pronounced with LSD than with psilocybin? We don't know any of that just because everything stopped in 1970 with respect to clinical work. So LSD is famously potent, even in the microgram range. Most people are, when they're using psilocybin, are getting it through mushrooms. So the vast majority of the mushroom isn't what's going to be psychoactive. Is pure psilocybin similarly psychoactive in the very, very small dose ranges, or is it a whole different animal? 20 to 30 milligrams is a good stiff dose of pure psilocybin. I don't know how many mushrooms you'd have to eat, and it would depend on what kind they were and how potent they were. But the effect in the mushroom is basically coming from the psilocybin and a little bit of psilocin that's in there. And uh, it's pretty stable. You can actually recrystallize psilocybin from boiling water. So people have made teas out of mushrooms. It's just not quite as potent. And one of the things we've done, found recently in research, is that LSD, when it gets in the receptor, stays there for a long time, for hours and hours and hours. Whereas other simpler molecules like serotonin, 
they're in the receptor and they're back out within just a few minutes. Psilocybin is actually broken down in the body to silus, and psilocybin has a phosphate protecting group on it, and you have enzymes in the body that clip that off. So psilocin, the dephosphorylated substance, is actually what's active. Yeah, so I suspect that psilocin probably is more like serotonin. It gets in the receptor and gets back out pretty quickly. But LSD takes a while to get in the receptor and takes a long time to get back out. And that's probably related to its high potency, but no one has really focused enough attention on that yet. There's one study that I read that said it's estimated that 30 million Americans, so about one person in 10, has tried a major psychedelic compound at some point. You think that sounds about right in your estimation? And what do you think distinguishes people that try a psychedelic once and say, you know, interesting or that wasn't for me, glad I did it, but never going to touch it again, versus people for whom it becomes an important recurring part of their life, something that they want to come back to? I think there are probably a lot of factors involved there. First off, the situation under which they took the substance. Psychedelics are the only class of drugs where set and setting have a major impact on the experience itself. Set being your mental expectations of what's going to happen and setting being the environment where you take it. And when I taught the pharmacy students at Purdue, I would use this sort of analogy. I said, imagine that you're under the belief that a psychedelic can provoke a spontaneous religious experience. Maybe you'll see God if you take this. And so you read a lot about mysticism and prophets and sort of the philosophy of religion and so forth. You prep yourself mentally and then you go to a church or synagogue or someplace where it's, you know, sort of a religious or spiritual type setting and you listen to evocative music, maybe listen to gospel music or something like that. The probability that you'll have a transcendent spiritual experience is high. And then I say, now, imagine you take the same drug, the same dose, and instead you go to a drive-in movie that's show on a Friday the 13th. Movie. <laughs> not a good idea. Don't do that. No. The class is already laughing, and I say, you probably are not going to have a religious experience. So a lot of people that have taken these have taken them in a situation where they may have been given too much. They didn't know what they were given. They were in a big, noisy party with people that they didn't know. All of a sudden, you've got panic, anxiety, and also the effects of LSD depend upon sort of the personality of the user. People who have a very rigid sort of controlling type personality, if this drug starts to break down their ego boundaries, they can have a serious anxiety, panic disorder, might have to be tranquilized with a benzodiazepine, something like that. And there are other people who have much looser boundaries or more open, etc. and they go, oh, this is cool, you know. And so you have the personality type, you have the set setting, you have the actual dose of the drug. So there are a lot of different factors that come into play, but there are indeed a lot of people that have had positive experiences. And 30 million, that may be an underestimate. I've seen that number, and I thought it was just for LSD, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was higher than that. I had a, a guy come into my office a couple months ago. He had just completed an engineering degree, decided to go to medical school, and he came in and he said, you know, you're the only one I know to ask this to. And he said, I had decided I wanted to take a psychedelic, and so I went to this music festival where I figured I'd be safe and there would be people there. I had a bad reaction. There were people that sort of would know how to handle it, etc. And he said, I took this substance, and he didn't tell me what it was. I suspect it was LSD. And he said, I was sitting on the grass, and all of a sudden the grass started turning into little people running around and I sunk into the turf and all of a sudden I was projected up into the sky looking down at my body. And then I had this encounter with this light force, I don't know what to call it, but it was just overwhelming, ecstatic, indescribable. And he said, when I came back out of that, I felt like I want to study these. This is really amazing. And so he went to the medical school and he wanted to know, was there going to be any possibility for him to do research in this field? And I said, you know, five years ago, three years ago, if he'd come to me and asked me, I would have said, you know, there's no chance. But I said, right now, we've got a couple big studies coming out. There's a lot of interest in this field. I think things will turn around. If you go to medical school, you've got four more years and a couple years of residency, so another six years. I said it's at least possible that when you finish your medical school and residency that there may be places doing research with these. I can't promise you, but I said at least there's hope. And he was kind of relieved. That's what he wanted to know was, you know, he wanted to do work in this area. A very smart guy. I've talked to so many people who have had life-changing experiences like that. And of course, there are the other people, like you say, that it was terrible. I, I had a terrible experience. It was a nightmare. And if you actually pin them down and say, well, I was this party and somebody spiked the punch. And you know, then I started feeling like I was losing my mind. And 
And so there are a lot of things involved in that, but you can have good experiences and bad experiences, but there are so many factors that are unlike virtually any other type of drug that's out there. Even people that have bad experiences, oftentimes it's sort of like the Stockholm syndrome where they still recognize that they got something out of the bad experience that they wouldn't necessarily wish they didn't have it. Oh yeah, that's common. I talked to someone who had a, an acute paranoid reaction to a psychedelic that they were taking and it lasted, I guess, for quite a while, a month or two. And afterward they said, yeah, you know, it was really awful and I was paranoid for a long time. And this person was, I think, was going into medicine, if I remember correctly. And they said, but you know, what it did was it, it made me feel like what these people that are paranoid schizophrenics feel, you know, like it's terrible. It made me even really want to get in and help those people. There was actually a serotonin researcher, big name, I won't use her name. She's retired, but at a major university in the United States, she did a lot of research on LSD and psychedelics. And the reason was she was a participant in an early experiment that the NIH carried out where they got volunteers and gave them LSD to look at their reaction, etc. She said it was a horrible, horrible experience. But I thought, boy, if a drug can do that, I want to understand what's going on. What do they do? How does that work in the brain? So she had a terrible experience and it led her into the field of research just to find out how something could produce that kind of awful effect. Sometimes it somehow changes your perception, gives you more acute perception and you see things you couldn't see. I think this is why some of you know the Silicon Valley people took them because they would get into tunnel thinking, couldn't see the forest for the trees, and it would force them to think out of the box. Maybe the thing was always there in their subconscious, but they couldn't break through. And then the idea comes out and they go, oh yeah. You mentioned openness and openness to new ideas. And I, th I thought that was one of the really interesting findings that the actual quantifiable personality trait of openness is something that they've seen long-term lasting changes, even from a, acute psychedelic doses. Can you talk a little about that, what that means, what openness is within a, a constellation of a person's personality? I think the ideal person would want to have a large degree of openness. That was a result that came out of the studies that Roland Griffiths did at Johns Hopkins, uh, where they did long-term follow-ups on these people. And a year, year and a half later, or two years later, they went through and assessed anything that had changed in their personality. And the only thing that was significantly changed was the degree of openness. They had increased levels of openness. And openness is pretty much what it means. Your humanitarian traits, altruistic traits, generosity, things like that. And the feeling has been, or the thought had been, that your personality was determined most of it by the time you're about two years old, and nothing really can change it. And of course, things can change it. Powerful traumatic events can change personality. But usually, you're stuck with what you are by the time you're out of your young years. So this was really an exciting finding, showing that with no expectation, their level of openness had increased. Their ability to tolerate divergent views, their ability to give altruistically, and those kinds of things. It's a really a positive finding for most people. Are there any other pharmaceutical interventions that are known to have long-term personality change, or at least potentially beneficial personality changes? I imagine you could poison somebody and do something bad in the long term. I'm not aware of anything like that. These substances are, are really unique. The question is also, in modern therapy, we tend to think about small molecule treatments. If somebody's depressed, we give them a reuptake blocker. Somebody's anxious, we give them a benzodiazepine. Somebody has this other problem, we're going to give them an antipsychotic drug. And yet here you have psilocybin in this program of therapy being used to treat anxiety, depression, alcoholism, nicotine addiction. There are hints that they may be useful for obsessive compulsive disorder. Imperial College just did an open label study with 12 chronic depressives who had been depressed and no treatment had worked. They responded to psilocybin. How can all of these things be working? You have to give up the notion that you're targeting a specific area of the brain with a specific small molecule to treat depression or anxiety or whatever. There's something globally is happening in the brain. And I think this is one of the most exciting things that we can look for to come out of this. Some of the work now with brain scanning has gotten uh, some very powerful techniques, magnetoencephalography, functional magnetic resonance imaging, where they can actually look at the brain currents. And they now know that virtually all psychiatric disorders are related to dysfunctions in the way these brain currents are moving around in the intact brain. And they're not healthy in people that have depression, anxiety, PTSD, etc. So somehow, hitting these 5-HD2A receptors changes connectivity. And the work out of Imperial College from Robin Card Harris and David Nutt's group has sort of shown this functional connectivity being dramatically changed by psychedelics. 
So it may be, it really is like a reset of a computer that's become really sloggy and you just hit the control, delete button. It may be that you've got these dysfunctional patterns of current in the brain that are leading to the symptoms of OCD, depression, anxiety, whatever. And when you give these psychedelics, you break down the local connectivity and expand it into a global connectivity throughout the brain. And that when the drug wears off, when things collapse back to their normal state of connectivity, that they lose these dysfunctional branches that cause the dysfunction in the first place. So I think we're looking at a new paradigm for the way these can be treated. And at the very least, if what we think is happening is actually what's happening, driving these functional connectivity patterns back to healthy patterns, it's going to tell us a lot about the origin of these diseases and maybe new approaches to treating them. So I think if we can get this field moving, it's really going to be an exciting time. And the sad part is there's no more than, what, a dozen investigators in the world that are really focusing on this. No money from the National Institutes of Health. You would think NIMH, NIDA, places like that would just be going, wow, let's do this, you know. But the problem is politics in this country. I've talked to a lot of people and they say, and this is what's going on. You have a lot of people in these government agencies who are really excited, would love to fund this stuff. But they're afraid if they fund it, somebody in the House of Representatives is going to get a hold of it and say, they're giving LSD to alcoholics. We got to stop that. And so it could be an end to everything again, because out of ignorance of the people that really don't understand this. So to a certain extent, it's good that there hasn't been a whole lot of publicity around it. And that's one of the things the Hefter Institute has tried to do, is kind of keep it under the radar until we have enough data. Respectable scientists are out there saying, you know, this is what we've done then it's too late for anybody to stop it because people are going to realize that this is a really important field. It's interesting. It's like in the 1960s and 70s, you can kind of easily envision who the mustache twirling villains were because they were trying to fight the Vietnam War and things like that. And this was a good way of marginalizing a huge amount of psychedelic proponents and accomplishing other political agendas. But like right now, other than just people being stick in the muds, it's hard to imagine what the anti-psychedelics lobby, if there was one, like what would be tying them together? I think, you know, there have been a lot of changes. A lot of people associated drugs with the anti-Vietnam War protest. And, you know, you've probably seen the interview that I think Ehrlichman did about Nixon. I guess Ehrlichman was telling the truth. He said, we realized that a lot of the Democrats and the young people were using marijuana and drugs. Well, we couldn't go out and shut them down by taking away their voting rights. But if we started prosecuting the drug war and locking them all up, we could have an indirect way to shut down those voters. And I had never heard that before. And I thought, wow. So the drug war started as a way to shut down progressive voters. I mean, think about uh, medical and recreational marijuana, how long that's been such a contentious issue. And now you see the gates starting to tumble there. Uh, Same-sex marriage until recently. And I think what it is is the millennials have grown up without a lot of the brainwashing. The Vietnam War era is, well, all the old guys. My father fought in World War II, and he fought in the Korean War. And then everybody should be fighting. You should go fight for your country. But then all these young people are going, oh, wait a minute. I don't know these people in Vietnam, in the jungle. You want me, you want to send me over to kill these people? And there was a draft, of course. So they protested, and rightfully so. And my father was a fairly conservative person. He says, oh, these damn drugs. These hippies are taking all these drugs and screwing up their minds. They're not patriotic anymore and all that so, A lot of people did that, and I think they connected it. So that generation, they're in their 80s and 90s now, if they're still alive. And I think the young people, a lot of them have tried ecstasy and have tried different things, and they don't have this cloud of fear over them. So the trick is going to be to bring it in to the culture in a reliable, authentic, and responsible way so that if people use these, they don't injure themselves and there's more knowledge about it and so forth. But I think these things are changing just because the generations, a part of it is generational change. Smart Drug Smarts. So a big, big thank you to Dr. David Nichols for taking the time for that conversation. Obviously, a bit of a shotgun blast of different topics there of the various things that psychedelics might be useful for. He mentioned depression, anxiety, alcohol and nicotine addiction, potentially obsessive compulsive disorder. And not to mention, although it's hard to quantify this, kind of giving researchers a window into what psychosis might look like from the inside. We've discussed in a past episode how one of the interesting things about psychedelics is they go by so many different names within the literature 
culture, each name of which has its own political stance. Everything from entheogens, which essentially means God-promoting compounds, to psychotomimetics to mimic the effects of psychosis. We've probably had a good four, five, six psychedelics-themed episodes now in this history of Smart Drug Smarts. Probably makes sense to bundle all those up, all the links in one place, and put those on a page. We'll do smartdrugsmarts.com slash psychedelics or something like that. We won't have that up by the time that this episode goes live, but that's something that we'll put up soon, and I'll mention that in the newsletter, The Brain Breakfast, when we get that live, which of course is an oblique reminder. If you have not yet signed up for the newsletter, you know what to do there. And of course, we should round things out before we move on with the necessary caveat that in most parts of the world, psychedelics are still illegal scheduled compounds. Should you use them, use them at your own legal risk, your own psychological risk, and definitely be aware of the potential negative consequences as well as the potential upsides. Probably if we do another psychedelics-themed episode, there are two things I think would be interesting to touch on next. One would be a user reaction, user anecdotes, similar to what we did with the Adderall Perspectives episode. And the other would be an episode specifically about bad trips. I feel like we've had so many generally positive comments on psychedelics that it would be worth showing what the dark side potentially is and talking with the people that have had to deal with that, both on the receiving end of the bad trip and also the medical first responders that have dealt with people that are freaking out from bad psychedelics experiences. But in any event, something still vaguely psychedelic, if you think about it in the right way, chocolate bunnies. And however did these things get to be a major part of an Easter tradition? Smart Drug Smarts, ruthless listener retention gimmick. For those of you who have been listening to the conversation I just had with Dr. Nichols and thinking, well, scientists really shouldn't be researching recreational substances, I would draw your attention to a recent article published by several PhDs on the seasonality of auricular amputations in rabbits, from which I quote the following passage. It has been speculated that traumatic auricular amputation in chocolate rabbits spikes during the spring. The most common predators appear to be humans of all ages. However, prior studies have not examined differences in rates by characteristics such as sex, age, or body mass index of the human predator. This study quite thoroughly is looking at the ways in which chocolate rabbits are consumed by humans during Easter, and their shocking finding based on over 28,113 respondents is that nearly 60% of people prefer to eat their chocolate rabbits starting with the ears, thus the auricular amputations mentioned in the study's title. 33% of chocolate rabbit eaters had no starting point preference, by the way, and a scant 4% said that they started with the tail or the feet, said the study's lead author, Kathleen Yaramchuk. It was interesting to discover that few other confectionery symbols, such as Santa, succumb to isolated defects like the chocolate bunnies do. So why did chocolate rabbits come to be a thing? They are not in the Bible, they do not have anything to do with the religious interpretations of Easter, but they certainly are popular now. It is estimated that 60 million chocolate rabbits are eaten by Americans each year, so that's one in five people eats a chocolate rabbit. But apparently the origins of chocolate rabbits can be traced back to Germany in a couple of different ways. There was a Germanic pre-Christian fertility goddess known as Ostera, and the word Easter, which is Ostern in German, that derives from her name. And as a fertility goddess, she had a rabbit as a sidekick because rabbits are so good at procreating. And eventually this rabbit sort of transmogrified into something called the Osterhaus, which was a rabbit that delivered colored eggs to children at Easter. So this is starting to get a little bit familiar now. Chocolate actually comes from the New World, not the Old World, so it wouldn't be something that was regularly available to Germans until about the 1800s, unless you were a royalty or something like that. But apparently the pin Pennsylvania Dutch imported this tradition of the Easter rabbit to America who delivered the colored eggs. And in 1890, a Pennsylvania shopkeeper named Robert L. Strohicker featured a five-foot-tall chocolate rabbit in his drugstore window to attract business. This caught on and became a thing. The original rabbit was 75 pounds, so it got scaled down a bit. But now this story goes back to Germany again. It was during World War II when cocoa was rationed that the hollow chocolate rabbits that we're now familiar with today came into vogue. They were hollow on the inside, but they were still big enough to sell for a pretty penny and allow candy manufacturers to stick with the rationing and use less cocoa than they would have otherwise. So that is the convoluted, cross-cultural, and surprisingly non-biblical story of how chocolate rabbits came to be associated with Easter. Just say no to dr- Ah, scratch that. Say yes to the Smart Drug Smarts podcast. Join our mailing list at www.smartdrugsmarts.com. Okay, that is it for episode number 176. Thank you for hanging around until the very end. If you enjoyed this episode, you will find everything that we talked about here up online at smartdrugsmarts.com slash 176. 
And if you missed last week's episode, in number 175, I spoke with a couple of guests, Dr. Scott Kilgore and Timo Ahapelto, about sleep deprivation, how that can affect the brain negatively, and the uses of light to alter our alertness, circadian rhythms, and other good stuff. And next week, we're going to be having another Know Your Neurotransmitters episode. We haven't had one of those in a while, but we're getting back on that horse, looking at a major neurotransmitter that has been mentioned many times in passing, but we've never really delved deeply into, acetylcholine, and also choline in the diet in general. That'll be next Friday. Have a great Easter in the meantime if you are celebrating. Have a great Bicycle Day in the meantime if you are celebrating that. And of course, above all, stay smart. You've been listening to the Smart Drug Smarts podcast. Visit us online at www.smartdrugsmarts.com and subscribe to our mailing list to keep your neurons buzzing with the latest in brain optimization. Smart Drug Smart should be listened to for entertainment purposes only. Although some guests on the show are medical doctors, most are not. And the host is just some random guy. Nothing you hear on this podcast or read at smartdrugsmarts.com should be considered medical advice. Consult your doctor and use some damn common sense before doing anything you think might have a lasting impact on your brain.